Well, welcome everyone to today's Mar guest lecture. Uh, our guest speaker today is uh, Arya Rabenbach, and he's the um, person that uh, I have been telling you about that is going to explain to us what's new in the federal records management space. So Arian works in the office of the chief records officer, and we're so pleased that finally NARA does have a chief records officer. So that's quite an uh, accomplishment for the records management field. Uh, Arian works in the National Archives and Records Administration out of uh, College Park, uh, UC that we're welcoming uh, comments uh, on Twitter and the hashtag SJSU Colloquia is on your screen for you. I'm going to uh, just go right over to Arian's first uh, slide and I'm going to uh, give the uh, mic over to Arian and uh, we'll get started. So Arian, it's all yours. Uh, thank you, Pat, and welcome everybody. I I'm glad you're able to join me today. Um, as Pat said, I, I want to keep this as informal as possible. So if you have questions, just uh, put them in the chat or raise your hand and speak up and we'll be happy to take them as we go along. Uh, what I thought I'd do or what I was, you know, Pat and I talked about doing is just sort of bring everybody, or sort of tell a story about all the changes. Um, I've been at NARA for 15 years. I'm started, I started at NARA in October of 2000. And the amount, if you, in that time period, um, there's certainly been a lot of change. I would say that if I were to divide my job doing records management for the federal government and doing the policy work that I do now uh, into segments that were all equal, the first 12 years were kind of pretty much it seemed like I was busy. But then, in, and as you'll see in the slide deck, in 2011, the White House put out a memorandum on uh, managing government records, making some changes for the way federal, rec federal agencies manage their records uh, to reflect modern technologies, to reflect the rise of electronic records, electronic record keeping, things like that. That memo came out in, in November 2011, right around Thanksgiving. To implement memorandum in the federal government, for those who aren't federal workers or those who don't know, you have to issue a directive that says, okay, here's the memorandum from the White House and now here's the directive. So the directive, the Managing Government Records Directive came out in August 2012. So since then, it's been a real sprint to meet all the deadlines in the directive. And we'll talk about those in the presentation. Uh, so that's where we've been, you know, the, the directive really marked that significant turning point for federal records management. It really got, uh, gave the National Archives a lot of attention and a lot of uh, focus on records management, which, as we know, and as headlines in the paper are, sometimes they're good things and sometimes they're bad things, and you don't necessarily want all the attention and, and everybody getting involved. But um, my joke is that my dad still thinks I'm a lawyer for some reason when I try to explain what I do that I write policy for the government. And at least now we're having more of a conversation where he starts to get it because every day there's a records management story in the news. And it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, prominent officials. My, when I taught you know, in workshops, I used to say, you can just pick up the Washington Post every morning and there is a records management story there somewhere. So. That's just sort of by, by general introduction. Here's the timeline of, of all the major pieces of legisl of all the major pieces of guidance that we've promulgated through our electronic records management policy shop. Uh, just briefly, I'm on the, the records management policy team. There's five of us around the country. We are a distributed team, so talking into a video camera sitting on top of my computer is not some, is something uh, very familiar to me because I have colleagues in Austin, Texas, and there's one in Ann Arbor, and there's one in Seattle. Uh, we've got a few here in the D.C. area. So that's, uh, that's how we operate. There's six of us on the team that write records management policy. And this is sort of our roadmap of all the, the major things that we uh, delivered and put out over the last few years. And we can talk, I can go into a lot of detail on every single one of these, but let's uh, See what you're interested in, and I'll, I'll when I go through the deck, and we'll stop at certain points to have uh, to go into a deeper dive. But as you can see, the the, the kickoff was in the presidential memorandum in 2011. The directive is what we wrote to implement the goals of the memorandum, which was again to modernize 
The presidential memo is really explicit about modernizing records management for the 21st century, sort of the White House commitment that, yes, agencies are using computers, people are using uh, modern technologies, and we have to get out of a world where every record schedule or agencies had record schedules that were written, frankly, in the 1950s and 60s and before computers and talk about paper and things like that. Uh, one of the major things, uh, the major pieces of guidance that we put out was in August of 2013 when we issued our capstone bulletin. Capstones are a new approach to managing email. Uh, one of the problems with email, again, going back to the, this 1940s, 50s models of records management, a lot of the current guidance, uh, even this, you know, 2010 guidance was print and file email. Nobody prints and files email. And that's sort of a, we had to get out of a mold where we were relying on people uh, to do things, to print and file email in record keeping systems. They, even eight people that have had uh, records management systems installed may not click and drag email. So Capstone was sort of our, our recognition of this problem and builds on the idea or the concept that most federal agencies uh, through their general counsel shops have purchased vaults where they where all their email is captured just for e-discovery purposes. Now those aren't record keeping systems and anybody who know is it familiar with the field understands sort of the distinction between a brute force capture of every single email message that goes across uh, that comes out or goes across a network. What we wanted to do is say, is there any way we could look at these systems that agencies are spending all this money on and leverage that into, and turn it into a records management uh, application or turn it in? What is there ways that we can leverage that functionality? And the Capstone Bulletin does that. It says basically for all, for the top level of the agencies, we're going to just declare all of those records permanent. So if you're the head of an agency, if you're the senior director, your email is likely to have permanent records in it, and we want to make sure all of those are captured, all of them are declared permanently. The Capstone Bulletin does have ex exceptions for uh, personal email, for non-record material, but the, uh, the, the, the key point with the Capstone Bulletin was it said, you've got all these email, it's now going to be permanent, we're going to capture it, and then we're going to manage it. Whereas before we were relying, pre-capstone, you're relying on agencies to capture it, manage it, and then declare it permanent. Well, if they're not capturing it and they're not managing it, you're never going to get permanent records. And so that's the sea change that where the capstone bulletin uh, led. In January of 2014, we updated the formats that we'll accept, and our format team, uh, my colleagues on the format team did a really good job of just you know, we were very restrictive at the National Archives on the kinds of formats we would accept for permanent records. These were boiled down into, you know, five or six categories, PDF, TIFF, the, the normal suspects. And it was very lacking because it didn't recognize that formats evolve and agencies evolve. The, the story I always tell about the format bulletins is when I was, when we had rolled out the digital photography guidance, uh, a few years ago, when that came out in 2004, 2005, something like that, there was a requirement that no pictures for permanent records could ha have less than 5.1, 5.1 megapixels was the requirement for digital ph photography. And I remember teaching that point to people, going out to agencies and talking to people, and they would say, we're never going to have a 5.1 megapixel camera. They're $2,000. They, they don't exist. We can't afford them. Here we are, you know, 10 years later, and everybody's got a phone in their pocket that shoots twice that, three times that. So it's just a, it just shows you that, uh, you know, it, it, formats are always tough when you do that kind of prescriptive guidance. The idea by resetting the formats is we have uh, more interactive tables and, and, and a better approach to managing that and being able to handle the evolution of technology. So as technology evolves and moves forward, uh, we're now more responsive to that. So uh, that was the, what the format bulletin was. 
the summer, last summer, uh, there were a lot of email stories around um, some federal agencies, the IRS, the VA, EPA a little bit. Uh, there was a lot of interest in, in Congress and the Office of Management and Budget. So they, were, they wanted us to do more email guidance. We put out a new bulletin th through another OMB NAR memo um, in September 2014. That email bulletin, so if you look for that bulletin, the 2014 bulletin, I call that our greatest hits of email guidance. Um, we've put out, the frustration we've always had on the policy side is we've issued guidance. You know, it, the first piece of guidance about email was not August of 2013 when Capstone came out. It was not, you know, January 2014 when we said, here is a format bulletin. We've long recognized that email was a record, and we've put out, we've been putting out guidance for years and years and years, uh, predating my career at NARA, you know, way back in the, in the late 80s. Uh, the first, and, you know, the first real email case in the government is, is the, the Prof's case, the Ali North White House email case of the late 80s. I mean, that's a, you know, this is a 30, 40 years old problem. Uh, and it gets frustrating when you put out all this guidance and how do people, what does it take to make, make it a real change? Uh, the email bulletin in 2014 was a, uh, I call that our greatest hits. We finally, we, like, we put out all these albums like a band does and all of a sudden, time to do a greatest hits package. You repurpose all your stuff, you rebox it up and you send it out again. So the 2014 guidance is our, uh, the greatest hits of email. Because of the email stories that came out that summer, um, the Congress finally updated the Federal Records Act. And this was significant because it's the first time we had legislative action to our underlying statute, uh, the Federal Records Act, since it was, the Federal Records Act was passed in 1950 and then it, was, it stayed on the books. Now we were given regulatory authority to go in and issue regulations to implement the, the law. But the law hadn't been changed since the 19, since 1950 when President Truman signed it. So it still talked about, uh, you know, machine readable materials was still in the law, for example. Congress did update the law in November 2014 to explicitly call out electronic records as records that need to be, needed to be preserved, called out email as a class of records, also included electronic messages, so text messages, uh, Google chats, but the Blackboard chats that we're doing here may or may not be a record. They may or may not have to be captured depending on your agency's uh, record schedule and what the content is. So it really reset a lot of our um, underlying guidance had to be reset, had to be looked at. And that's the, the November 2014 updates to the Federal Records Act. So that's the piece that reset the laws, gave us, uh, in a way, and not, I wouldn't call it new authorities, just expanded the authorities we had to, to do our work and really recognized uh, the preeminence of electronic records in the modern age. Uh, this July, past July, we updated, our, we issued a new bulletin on electronic messages. This one is, is uh, significant because it, it gets to the issue of text messages on uh, mobile phones and are they records, are they official records that need to be managed and, and preserved. And that messaging bulletin of July 2015 sort of gets to that, uh, it raises that issue. And just this week on, today is Thursday, uh, on Tuesday we rolled out our minimum metadata bulletin. So. Uh, when you're starting to transfer electronic records to the National Archives, what are the minimum metadata elements that we're looking for uh, for those records? Now that's an interesting bulletin because I can, you know, if you, if you study metadata or you're interested in metadata, you know that you can have a serious conversation about schemas and things like that. The problem is most of the people who do records management in the federal government, most people aren't really interested in metadata. They don't know what it is. So it was kind of hard to write a minimum metadata bulletin. If you're really interested, I suggest reading the bulletin. It's based on Dublin Core, it, and it just has a few elements. Now, internal to NARA, we have our own metadata requirements for records that we're going to eventually make available to fit in our catalog and things like that. One of the projects for the coming year is to allow, start aligning 
the NARA requirements for things like our catalog, our online public access space with the minimum metadata requirements. Um, so those are the big pieces of guidance that we've put out over the last few years. Um, the Managing Government Records Directive is the, the be-all and end-all of this, the, the main piece of, of, of guidance, and it came out August 24th of 2012, and as I said, that's the, that's the piece that set, reset uh, records management in the federal government. In the, in the directive, it explicitly calls out two goals, two big headline goals, and one of them is to uh, require electronic record keeping to ensure transparency, efficiency, and accountability. Again, recognizing that agencies have converted their paper-based systems to electronic systems, federal government work is being carried out with electronic systems, electronic records, and we need to manage those. We need to make sure we're, our guidance is uh, appropriate around electronic records. So that's uh, explicitly spelled out in the in, as one of the goals. The second goal is to put agencies on notice that they had to demonstrate compliance with records management statutes and regulations, and that gets that speaks to the one of the challenges we've always had in records management. And we work with all the agencies. Our appraisal staff would go out and work with a lot of the agencies. Um, the, the the challenge would be how do we make sure you know, they're following the, the proper procedures, proper uh, requirements that we've put out. In the agencies, we always heard, well, I've got two people doing records management. My agency is hundreds of people. How do I make this work? I don't have any senior support. So the directive requires agencies to have uh, some senior support. And I'll get to, I'll explain that in a little, in a, in a little bit. The record keeping piece is divided into two milestones that are coming uh, that we that we are working towards in a very you know these are things we're doing uh, every day so by 2016 by the end of 2016 December 2016 agencies have to manage permanent and temporary email in accessible electronic form so all email has to be managed electronically well you might say well is an email by nature electronic it is but remember, we had a lot of guidance that was out there for years that said print and file your email. So we want to declare a desk to print and file, just manage them as electronic, in electronic formats, delete what you can, and move forward. Uh, get out of the print and file business because nobody was printing and filing email. And if somebody is printing and filing email, I'd be curious to, to see how much how that working. The other piece is uh, 2019, by the end of 2019, so we've got a few years for that, but it's, it's fast approaching. Agencies must manage all their permanent electronic records in electronic formats. And again, that's not saying um, all records, it's saying permanent records that National Archives staff and the agencies have appraised as permanent and have been scheduled as permanent. And if they're electronic records, they have to stay in electronic formats. That's extending the print and file the, the death of printed file, if you will, to all kinds of records, any kind of record that's a, a permanent electronic record. Now, to do that, agencies may or may not have to change their systems, change the way they do business, and that kind of gets to the, you know, the number one question we get around that goal is, do you mean all electronic government, all, no paper in government? Well, I don't think, we're not proposing that, but I think part of the thinking agencies have to, th have to go through is, you know, if we're going to do this for our permanent electronic records, maybe we need to do this for all the records, and that's how we hope that'll play out. So there's a, that, I mean, it builds obviously off the email goal and get to the place where we're just dealing with electronic records instead of uh, a variety of formats. The other thing I talked about was the compliance uh, piece. Uh, the second goal of the directive is a explicit instructions to agencies on demonstrating compliance with records management statutes and regulations. And the, the way they do that, say yes, they have a senior agency official. So we told agencies to establish a, a person in your off, in your agency who had, I call them a senior agency official and put records management in their portfolio. So they're responsible for carrying out records management. 
There's also some pieces around accountability and training. Accountability for records officers. Uh, there are, each agency has a, a designated records officer that works with us on uh, these record scheduling issues, the transfer issues, uh, implements our guidance in an agency. We wanted them to be properly trained and properly identified. And we also told agencies to develop appropriate training for all staff. I'm a federal employee. I have to take uh, online courses every year. I have to do two hours on computer security. I have to do an hour on facility security. I have to, there are things I have to do. Um, we would like to see, in a perfect world, 10 minutes on records management. So every federal employee at least knows uh, the basics of records management. And that we hopefully we can get that through uh, sort of that piece, through the, the up, you know, getting the training working, things like that. When I talked, uh, so the last slide I mentioned that each agency has a, has a senior agency official. They're responsible, for, these are the kinds of things that we want them to be responsible for. Uh, making sure that they're the champion of records and information management in the agency. So it's somebody who has to be a senior leader who has the ability, as the last bullet says, to deal with agency practices, budgets, personnel, to make sure that the agency is spending the resources it needs to meet the targets and the directive, the email goal, the training goal, the, the 2019 permanent records goal. And that person's responsible for making sure the agencies do the right thing. And that's the compliance piece. We recognize that there's going to be some coordination with the agency records officer, making sure that the agency, uh, the senior agency officials and the records officers have uh, are on the same page, that they work together in tandem. We don't want to undercut the role of the records officers and the, role, the good work that they've been doing in agencies. One of, the, one of the other steps in the directive was a new job series in the federal government, uh, explicitly dedicated to records and information management. So it's this 0308 series, and you'll see the link there to our blog post about it. Uh, this is a significant piece of work because for the first time, there are actually jobs in the federal government explicitly devoted to records and information management. They're not anything else. I mean, for a long time, you know, I was a, uh, for a while I was a, I was just in, I was in the IT series for a while, for a while. I'm now a policy analyst. Uh, you're not a records person. And in agencies, we heard the same stories. A lot of agencies' records staff were uh, management analysts, the, the big generic bucket called management analysts, not talking about explicit requirements for what you know, what makes a good records officer? What are, the, what are the requirements for a good records officer? You could be a perfectly good management analyst. You can be a perfectly good federal employee, but have no background in records, no training in records. So the fly sheet is what OPM uses to start establishing uh, jobs. Uh, goes to agencies and agencies write position descriptions based on a fly sheet. That fly sheet came out in March of this year and established, for the first time, established um, what sort of the baseline of what records, you know, that position in the federal government, records and information managers. And we hope that's the, a way to help us build, to implement, again, these goals in the directive. I mean, the directive puts these targets out there, and we want to build in some uh, support for getting that work done, making sure that we uh, have success. So the one thing, and we were talking a little bit about jobs at the beginning, and, you know, that's the, um, the, the the interesting thing about where I think this is going, because in a couple of years, I think there'll be a lot of agencies hiring people to explicitly deal with records and information. You know, that in this, this job series, we've seen that uh, we've seen it start. Uh, some agency, there are some jobs in USA Jobs right now that are this 0308 series. So we've seen some uh, movement in that direction, and I hope there's a, a lot more, especially for for students, for people getting involved in the profession. Um, other things that I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about, um, again, these are all coming out of the, the, the work of the directive. The, uh, the automated technologies, one of the challenges or one of the, the, uh, one of the requirements in the directive is that we, we start investigating 
automated technologies and what we could do to automate a lot of these processes. Again, going back to the email problem, you know, there are systems in place, whether or not people use them or don't use them remains uh, an open question. So it's how do you get uh, improvement in that space? How do you think, how do you, how do, you know, how, how can we make this easier for agencies? So we wanted to explore some automated technologies. Are there automated solutions to do that? We issued a report that was both a plan and a report. So it was a report on sort of where we saw the state of technology today, where it was, and sort of some plans, some ideas we had for the future. And part of that work is like leveraging the federal CIO council community. The CIOs are active and they meet, they talk about these issues. If we can leverage that community, maybe we can start getting some support for building tools or helping us out. We were also explicitly tasked with um, investigating open source tools, finding out, you know, uh, which tools were freely available and how they can be used in government. And that's, you know, obviously if, 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 we, if we can leverage open source, the communities that are around open source tools and techniques uh, would be very helpful. I briefly outlined the training requirements, all records officers, those individuals who work directly with us on a daily basis um, need to have uh, our certificate of records management training. And we've built out some communities of interest uh, around the federal records space. So if you are a federal employee and you're interested in, in the work we're doing, uh, you can get an account on OMB Max, which is OMB's wiki platform. And then you can join our, our Federal Records Officer Network or our Electronic Records Working Group. I think that's what it's called. Um, so those are some communities of interest that have been established on OMB's platform to allow records officers to get together. Because again, one of the things we've always heard is that I'm a records office, I'm a records manager for uh, Treasury and I work in New York City and I don't know, I mean, I can't, I don't know if anybody else is dealing with the same kind of problems that I am. Uh, so that's, that's a, uh, a community that we, was set up to us to uh, enable that. I see the question, are student contractors also able to do that? Um, my understanding is it's open to anybody with a .gov email address. So if you can get on OMB Max with a .gov email address, um, then you can uh, join the community because we, we do want to have uh, a lot of different voices there. So I would say yes. Um, and so the communities of interest, and that's an area we're, we're interested in exploring and doing more with. Uh, we, we don't want to take, we want to support them and let them maybe work together on some things. Uh, the, our position at the National Archives is we don't want to dictate where they go, but we want to be there for when they have questions or, or they, want, they need the policies analyzed, something like that. So we can help them with that. Uh, the last, I think that's my next slide, or that's my last slide. Um, just our blog, that's where we put all the, the latest and greatest. You can subscribe to the blog and, you know, follow along all the updates and records management, everything you need to know. This should be, if you're interested in federal records management, this should be on your, on your blog shopping list. Um, you can subscribe to email updates, and unlike some blogs, if you subscribe to email updates, you get the whole update in your email. You don't get to click the link and actually read it on the blog. Uh, uh, yes, we also have a YouTube channel. Uh, the YouTube channel we use for, uh, we actually stream our, so every other month we have our bi-weekly, our bi-monthly records and information discussion group, or bridge. The bridge meetings are live streamed um, from our McGowan Theater, and they're available. They're up there on YouTube now, so you can watch, you can go back and watch all the bridge meetings for uh, for a couple of years. They're, I think they're all out there on YouTube. Um, so we, we, we do use record, we do put, um, so NARA has a general YouTube channel for putting out events that come out of a McGowan Theater, all the speakers that come and all the, the programs, and obviously that's a, a large portion of our mission. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the, as I like to joke, it's the National Archives and Records Administration. I work in the Records Administration side, which is the non-glamorous side. Nicholas Cage never stole anything from us. And, you know, what we do on our YouTube channel is our 
bi-monthly bi records and information discussion group. Uh, there are some training uh, videos that have been put together out there um, that you can feel free to explore and, and, and spend all your time looking at. Uh, so that was about my half hour of, of straight talk. Um, if there's anything, uh, feel free to reach out to me afterwards. And I, I think I can just open it up now for um, discussion, questions, anything in particular people would like to hear more about. Thank you. Uh, if any of you have questions, just hit the hand right underneath your name. You'll see three icons, smiley, uh, and away, and then a hand. Raise your hand, and you could use the mic or you could chat in the chat area. Thank you so much, Erin. What a great chat. I was wondering if um, forthcoming there's going to be more directives for things beyond metadata and email, such as social media? Oh, so we do have, um, we have issued a social media bulletin. It was outside of the, con uh, the construct of the directive, and that was something uh, we put out uh, 2014-02. Uh, it was our last, it was our guidance for that. So I think I can put that in the chat. There. Um, so that bulletin uh, came out in October of 2013. Was the, was a bulletin that we've done on, on specifically social media uh, updated. We, we'd actually put out guidance uh, a few years ago on blogs and wikis and RSS. That was like 2005, 2006, and then we updated it in 2010, and the new, latest update is this one, the 2014 uh, update uh, that, we, that we put out. And this just, again, it's the same premise that agencies are using these tools. NASA is a big user of social media. Those, re those are federal records. They need to be preserved. They need to be managed. Do they need to be kept forever? That's a scheduling and appraisal question, but we at least want to have that discussion. Um, does everybody's tweets need, you know, I'm an active user of Twitter. Does any, do, do all my tweets need to be preserved forever? Probably not, but if I'm the, if I'm Brock, the president's a bad example because there's a different set of laws for that. But um, if I'm the, uh, Secretary of the Department of Energy, and I'm using Twitter, uh, are my tweets permanent? And the short answer probably is yes, but we had to, we had to issue some guidance. And then the, the bulletin spells out the questions and the challenges. A lot of times we don't necessarily have a lot of answers because the technology is new or the technology is emerging, but we want to put agencies on notice that these are things they need to think about. And social media is a good example of that. The messaging bulletin that I referenced earlier is an example of that as well. Real, uh, so I think one of the things that we're on the hook to do, and, and more guidance will be coming out in this area uh, shortly, is we do have to define success criteria for 2016 and, we'll, and let agencies know exactly what it means to be successful. Do I think we can, do I think agencies can realistically meet it? I, my, <laughs> It's a good angel, bad angel thing, the, the devil on your shoulder, the angel on your shoulder. Uh, I, think, I think agencies need to show, need to demonstrate significant progress. And I think what we're going to do is, is hopefully put out some um, measures of success criteria that kind of uh, start to lead those discussions or start agencies having these discussions so we can, we can say, yeah, they've, they've made significant progress. Uh, for years, we've been doing a uh, records management self-assessment where agent, we ask agencies certain questions and they report back to us um, uh, how they're doing. The, in this year's report, uh, which is not out yet, but I've seen, I've, I've read it a couple times and then looked at it. Uh, we do ask explicitly, are you going to meet the, is your agency going to meet the, the deadline? And overwhelmingly agencies say yes. So if, based on that, I think, um, you know, that, I think that is something, you know, could, we're committed to, to may, helping agencies reach the goal. I don't want to get into a game where we have a list of agencies that are better than others or there. We don't want to do that. We just want to make sure that we move forward. And I think, I think it's a long way of, of getting to the answer. Realistically, it may be a challenge, but I think we're going to make sure that we uh, explain that, tell a story around that, build out some, some good things. So 
you know, having that discussion and, and moving forward is, is, I think, much more valuable. Before I was on the electronic records policy team, uh, or the rec what we call the record management policy team now, uh, I was the lead appraisal archivist for Navy records, and I would go around looking at all kinds of Navy records. And I know that was always an issue, because that's another thing we always hear. It takes a long time to get schedules approved, and that's an area that we're trying to you know, get better at. One of the goals in the directive, one of the targets in the directive for us to meet is, is a reevaluation of our appraisal criteria. And I didn't really talk about this, about that in this slide presentation or the updates to the GRS that we're doing. So there's a lot of pieces of work um, that are taken as a whole, really going to improve the way we do our business, uh, uh, approving rec schedules from agencies, approving things from agencies, getting things done, getting things out, which I think would help all of these records management challenges uh, in the federal government. Because I think that's where, it, that's something we can do to make everybody's jobs easier, and if we can get to a place where those are easy, then I think we can all make these, uh, you know, getting out the door. And there's a comment about local government, um, and the glad to see our guidance on metadata and naming conventions. That's, that's exactly uh, what we think we can do. That's value we think we can add to, to the ar archives, rec government community especially. It's one of the things we're very interested in is are there, uh, if you read our strategic plan, we talk about leadership, and, and that's an example of that, is we want to make sure that we're a resource. Because I think, I may spend a lot of time at archives conferences and even, rec, you know, go to SAA meetings, go to ARMA meetings, go to NAGARA meetings. NAGARA is a little different because it's all, it's generally government, so this problem is not a NAGARA problem. But at SAA, you feel like, well, you know, they're not really talking about government issues. They're not talking about issues that relate to government records and 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 local that those that those, that tranche of, of agencies is in that space. And that's always well. I think we're doing a lot of good work, and I think a lot of a lot a lot of levels of government are doing good work. But we need better vehicles to share. And I know Pat and I are both serve on the Nagara board, and that's an area that we're interested in. You know, demonstrating some leadership there. So I think there's. Um, I have a lot of movement in that direction, and I'm happy to see it. Because one of the things, again, not a criticism of SAA, it's just how SAA has evolved. It is a, it's a very university-centric uh, profession, at least if you look at SAA meetings. And the big players are in the college's university section. And that's good, but their challenges are not government challenges. Uh, there's some similarities, but there's 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 a there's a place where it departs, and that's a space that we think uh, NARA can better fill. Thank you once again. And just following up on your last comment, what were there any influences in your policy directives from say other globally, other national archives, Australia, UK, Canada, and do you have okay. connections with your colleagues there? Yes, we do. Uh, we have a monthly. Uh, more with Canada than, than the UK or Australia. So um, I should say our format, the head of our format team, Kevin Divorcey, uh, had worked for two years at the Archives of New Zealand. So he's very familiar with the New Zealanders and the Australians. He brings us that perspective. Uh, we have a monthly conference call with our Canadian colleagues. We've just started that um, about a year ago, we've been doing that for about a year, and that's again to just recognize that we're doing, we're dealing with, um, yes, laws are different. The Library Archives Canada mission is sort of an amalgamation of both the Library of Congress and the National Archives under one roof. So they've got uh, a different scope, but some of these records management concerns are the same, and some of the issues around social media and, and things like that are the same. So we've kind of identified some people on on their policy side. Uh, we've had a couple teleconferences. I know, you know, I spent a week in Ottawa in November last year, uh, meeting them and, and just starting to en enable those uh, that exchange. And those conversations are very interesting. And we do we do that once a month to keep the you know. Sometimes it's just yeah, here's what we're working on, and they tell us what they're working on, and it's just a you know one hour to exchange that kind of stuff. But it is you know building out those relationships because there there is some. Um, potential there for, for partnerships and, and just understanding and getting a, getting good policy together 
when we do uh, then another plug for the blog is as we do these policies and as we develop these these bulletins, we always put out a draft on the blog. So the the, the early versions go on the blog. We take comments for metadata. If, for instance, we did get comments from Harvard, uh, we got comments from the. You can be anonymous on the blog, so some comments came from anonymous people. <laughs> so I don't know where they are, but they were good comments. Uh, so the draft version, uh, we, we, I mean, we look at all those comments, we take them in, we, we evaluate them, uh, and that's always, it's, it's good to see that there are people, uh, you know, sometimes you think you're working in a vacuum and, you know, nobody cares, but so there are people who get involved and, and make comments on the blog. So as we develop policies, uh, we put drafts on and welcome public participation. Uh, before we go to Beaudry, I just wanted to comment that Lisa is uh, one of our instructors, Arian, and she's uh, from Toronto, and we do have a number of students in our program from Canada, uh, which explains her, her interest in this. So I, I'm glad I didn't complain about the weather in Ottawa in November. <laughs> you did well. And now, uh, Beaudry, well, I think a hand was up, and I think she's away now, or did you hit your away button by accident? It looks like she said in the chat window that she doesn't have a question. It was just an oops. All right. Anyone else? Thank you very much, Arian, for your presentation. Uh, this was so informative, and I know our students uh, have gotten a lot out of it.